I never let it affect me in front of anyone. But on the ride home from football practice that day, I remember praying to God to take my dad out of my life. Make him go away. Make my mom stop crying. Make the terrible feelings for my brothers and me go away. About two months later on Christmas Eve, God would answer my prayer. Just not in the way I ever expected it. Hello, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cheer Denise. Um, if you have come to this channel to see the review of Tyler Zed's new book, Trailer Park Parable, today is the day. It's publication day, and we're going to do part one of it today. Um, this book is astounding, and it's not my typical fare. And when Tyler sent me the book, he acknowledged the fact that it wasn't necessarily what I usually do. And he said, you know, I'm not a, a celebrity, you know, I'm. you do royal stuff, you do celebrity stuff. If you don't want to review this book, I understand. I'm not exactly this type of person that you are talking about. But this cha channel is memoirs and biographies. And I was like, all right, I'll read it. And I don't know what I expected it to be, but this so exceeded my expectations. It was written so profoundly well that I think that if you if you watch Tyler Zed's channel, and many of you do who, ha, who are watching this review now, it's why you've come, that channel is super light and fun, and it's not heavy. It's not trying to be heavy. It's meme reviews. And it's, you know, f funny takes on political issues, and it's just not a heavy channel. And if you've seen he and his brother together, they just banter and it's light and it's like nobody's laying the heavy stuff on, right? And so it, it could be easy to think that he and his brother have stumbled happily through life and have just, you know, sort of just figured out this whole YouTube thing. And they just like started making videos and like, you know, just a couple of brothers having a great time together. And I think very few of you, unless you personally know them, would have any idea what their life was really like growing up and how traumatic it was. And, and none of that comes through on that channel. And so this is a really startling book for a lot of reasons, but even far apart from the fact that the story is a jaw-dropping story. Tyler is such a great storyteller that he makes you unable to put the book down. I could not put it down. I mean, every single chapter ends with a cliffhanger and you're like desperate for more. And the way he tells the stories in the book is he will start with one story. Then he takes you to another story. You're, you're sort of like boomeranged off to this other story. Then he brings it back full circle, ties it up in this beautiful, satisfying little bow. So not only is the story riveting, but the storytelling is so exceptional. Um, and it's such a, like you're on the edge of your seat the whole time that I couldn't, wait to bring this book to you. So let's get started. If you will comment, like, and subscribe, if you will send this review to a friend who you think would be interested in it, I would so appreciate it. And if you are here for my royal stuff, don't worry. We are going to get back on our Diana book next week. We're going to go ahead and start that next week. But because this was the publication week for this book, I wanted to go ahead and just schedule this week for Trailer Park Parable. So I promise you will enjoy this one. All right, chapter one begins with the story that this entire book revolves around. And he never tells you everything you want to know about it. You got to keep reading, keep reading, keep reading, because he's going to feed you little parts of the story all along the way. And it's part of what keeps you turning those pages, because you've got to find out what he's talking about in this scenario and in various other places. Okay, the date is December 28th, 2007. He writes, four days had passed since I thought I'd witnessed my mom die. For those entire four days, I sat and listened to music by myself, wondering if mom was going to be okay, and still in shock at what had happened on Christmas Eve, replaying it all in my head frame by frame, over and over and over. I was 17, my brother Devin was 16, and Beau was 11. We sat outside mom's hospital room waiting to go in and see her. My heart raced. I didn't know what to expect or what to say to her. I don't remember exactly who spoke, but someone told the three of us to be prepared to see your mom in rough shape. It's not good. And they weren't kidding. As we walked in, I saw mom sitting up in the hospital bed. I only knew it was her because I heard her say, hi guys, and it was her voice. 
but her face was unrecognizable. It was black and blue. One of her eyes was completely swollen shut, and the other had blood in it. Never in my life had I felt so many emotions at once. Anger, guilt, worry, and relief to see my mom and to see her alive. I sat on one side of the bed and my brother sat on the other side. Whoever let us in had closed the door behind us, and for the first time in four days, it was just the four of us again, alone. I could feel the lump in my throat growing and the tears welling up. I did everything I could to hold them in. I needed to be strong. Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, I kept telling myself. And then he lurches off to a different story. Okay, so just when you're just like, what? What happened to his mom? You know, like he thought she had died, you know, when he sees her and she's completely physically unrecognizable. And the only way he knows her is by her voice. And you're like desperate to find out what happened. And then he goes and he tells you something else. But I love the way he does this because he just goes back and forth and back and forth. And he's going to wrap it all up. And you are going to just be like, ah, oh, perfect, perfect the way you did that. So, so, so he shoots off into the future. Now it's March 2011. And he says, when we're kids, we think that the adults around us know everything. It took me until I was 20 to fully understand that there is no such thing as a grown up. I just started basic training in Texas and all around me, grown men were crying. I held a little piece of paper in front of my face, waiting to read it off word for word as the phone rang in my ear. It was the first week. And one of those silly things the trainers do to stress out new recruits is give them a piece of paper with a script to read. Then the MTIs, that's the military training instructors, tell them to call home for the first time, but the new recruits can only read from the script. No other words at all. If they say anything at all, the MTIs yell at you while you're on the phone with your loved ones and make you hang up on them. The paper was only about three sentences long. It said something like, I made it safely. This is my address. It was very simple text to read, but more than half the guys in my flight of 60 couldn't handle it. I looked around and tears were flowing as I tried to read the script. Grown men in their 20s crying like children, talking to their moms and wives, wanting to say more, but not being able to while the MTI sat ready to pounce. One kid started reading from a script and I heard, what the frick? That's not what that says. Read the damn paper. The kid cried harder and another MTI sprinted from across the room and started yelling at him. The MTIs loved that. At the first sign of a trainee pissing themselves in fear or discomfort, the MTIs all turned into vultures and jumped on the fresh meat. Hello? I heard mom's voice. I quickly snapped my eyes back from across the room to my piece of paper, but first I made sure that there were no MTIs around me before I spoke. Mom, I said, I'm supposed to read this card, but just grab a pen real quick. I have an address for you. I miss you, love you guys, can't say anything else. An MTI turned around and I started reading the script before he heard me say more. My mailing address is the following. Never once did a tear well up. It seemed like a pretty silly thing to cry over. I knew Mom would understand. And it's not that I didn't miss her or home, but I knew all this was temporary, and so did she. I could get to call home again at some point and be able to explain if she had questions from a million forums online that talk about that exact phone call. After hanging up, I stood at attention and waited until everyone was done with their calls, watching others get yelled at and others cry. This was not what I had expected at all when I left for basic training. But this seemed to be the theme of that first week, finding out that I had a warped idea of what my experience would be like. Because so like he had an expectation, you know, you watch enough military movies, you think it's all going to be real hardcore the entire time and that everybody else is going to be hardcore too. And that they didn't come here to cry on the telephone to their mom, right? And to sit there and see all these people blubbering like fools would have just been sickening, especially if you thought you were going to come and like be with a bunch of other hard asses like you and then everyone's crying over not being able to say what they want to say on the phone. It'd be super disconcerting. So he says he was expecting to be surrounded by dozens of guys running six minute miles and doing 100 push ups with ease and walking around emotionless like military robots. And he had been worried that he wouldn't have what it took, you know, like, you know, will I be able to run with the big dogs here? Well, this was not the case. I was well prepared to handle basic, if not over prepared. I don't say that braggingly either. My perception of basic training in the military were far from reality. I clearly watched too many Navy SEAL movies. And I think this happens with many people who join with certain high expectations. But the thing is, is that he was prepared and not necessarily for a great reason. He says, I also didn't realize at the time that my upbringing had over prepared me for this kind of emotional manipulation. It's part of the reason my peers called me the perfect trainee, graduating with honors and excelling in almost everything we did. 
Our, bring, our upbringing also helped my brother Bo graduate number one in his Navy basic training class, literally number one out of 1,200 recruits in his unit. To say that I was proud as hell of him is an understatement. And he says, we didn't know why at the time, but we were perfect candidates to handle the emotional game of the military. More than prepared. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And he says, look, I'm not saying the basic training was like a, a cakewalk. Okay? I mean, it was hard. But it just wasn't as hard as he thought it was going to be. And it just was more of a mental game than a physical game. He said the entire point of basic training in any branch is to attach you from your previous life and identify and make you prioritize your new identity. The, these new military duties will deal with life and death situations and attention to details a must. Worrying about your individual lifestyle, ethnicity, religion, and so on, it gets in the way of that. There's no time for that in the military. You either grow the hell up or get over all that or get out. There's a mission, and the mission comes first. And for some people, that's hard to do, depending on what the previous life was like. And then he gives like an example of what are these mental games are. So he's like, well, you know, the Marines had it the worst. Um, And he had heard from a friend of his that one of these mental games is that you're all there and you come into basic training. And he said his friend was told that North Korea had just attacked America and that they're all going to be shipped out like the next week. And because those trainees have absolutely zero contact with the outside world, they had no idea that that wasn't true. You know, so it's like always trying to play around with your mind, always trying to see like who is the weakest link, who can we pick off, who is not going to be able to withstand. Um, He says, talk about a mind screw. The mental games in the Air Force basic training were nowhere near that level, but they still existed. So he said the entire driving force of the military is fear. One way they teach you this principle is by public humiliation. There's no greater driving force in our lives than peer pressure and trying to fit in with the people around you, at least for a large majority of the population. Getting yelled at in basic isn't fun, but if you're the weak link out in the operational military, the punishment for failure is far worse than embarrassment. Don't let your team down. Do your damn job and do it right all the way down to the tiny details. The consequences could be life or death. Some people are able to fall in line with this concept and others are just meant to be weak links. So then he tells us about two people that he was in training with who were complete opposites here. And the first one was a guy named Aquande. And another guy was named Huey. Now, Akwande was about 30 years old. He was from Nigeria. And Tyler says the guy couldn't march or do push-ups to save his life. And every time he messed up, the rest of the flight got smoked for it. We'd either have to do push-ups or flutter kicks while Akwande stood at attention and watched us. And he felt bad for failing us. At least that was the goal. The psychology behind it is to get the rest of us pissed at Akwande for not performing. And for Akwande to succumb to the peer pressure and the fear of letting everyone down again so he would do everything right the next time. Well, for the first few weeks, everyone was mad at Aquande because he was constantly getting them in trouble because he could not keep up. So Tyler, along with everybody else, hated this guy. You know, I mean, it's like, hold up your end of the deal, man. We're suffering because of you. Well, around about the fourth week, he and Aquande were put on door watch together. And he said that there was always two people who had to watch the door, um, and you would let people in and out of the dorm. It was had to be two people because, you know, you might get down on your basic training and somebody might decide that they just had enough and like off themselves. So you got to ha- make sure that there's two people there. So he's stuck with a Quande and he's not going to be a jerk. You know, he's going to ask the guy like, okay, you know, what's your story? And he said that, Aquande said, I ran my own business in New York City. Apparently he had a wife and they had moved from Nigeria to New York, and he had owned five hot dog stands. But in his tribe in Nigeria, no one was running any hot dog stand. He was he had been part of royalty, and he'd lived the high life, you know. And now he was reduced to these circumstances because he had married a woman who was outside of the tribe, and they basically exiled him, and so he'd come to America to try to figure this out, he decided to join the Air Force so that he could earn his citizenship. He says that he never saw the guy cry, and he gives him credit for that. And from that day forward, he says, I never felt an ounce of animosity toward Aquande. I had a lot of respect for him after hearing his story, and after I saw that he was improving by leaps and bounds in the physical part of training. I respected him even more. Whenever we had a task, I would ask him if he needed my help. And he started doing the same for me. 
At the end, Aquande still wasn't ripping out 100 push-ups in a minute. And he wasn't the perfect marcher, but he definitely was not the worst. It was probably the most improved. He was also my friend, my fellow American, after they granted his citizenship for his service to his country, which was well-earned. Okay, so that's one side of the coin, you know. You know, you got all these jokers who can't manage it. And you got the Aquandes of the world who can't manage it but are trying and at least, you know, pull it together at the end. And then you have the baby Hueys of the world. This guy, he says, was someone who shouldn't have been made it past a doormat at the recruiter's office in New York, but sadly represents about 20-30% of the military population today, in his experience. Then he gives a rather scathing de- description. He says Huey's real name isn't important because from day one, the MTI saw this 20-year-old's baby face and they all called him Baby Huey. I haven't pinned it down, but it was either the baby face that painted the target on him or the track suit or the bushy mullet he arrived in or the chocolate candy bar crusted on his lips. Not kidding. Or the two giant suitcases filled with household items like an iron and a gallon of laundry detergent. Or maybe it was his bag of milk body that looked like it hadn't left the gaming chair until he left to join the Air Force. Roughly 29% of the U.S. population aged 18 to 24 is eligible to join the military. This kid was not part of that 29% and was visibly a recruiter's attempt to meet his quota. Unlike Aquande, there was also no will within Huey to get better and adapt. Now, he stops telling us about baby Huey because he wants to let us know about the drill sergeant. His name was Sergeant White. He was from South Carolina. He was real proud to be in the Air Force, and he was super tough. He says, I don't know if this was planned or not, but when we all got off of the airplane in San Antonio onto the bus, we were driven to the base in our dormitory. And when we arrived, I thought for about six hours that it was all going to be a real cakewalk. The first guy that they meet is real mild-mannered. Y'all get off the bus. Y'all put your things over here. You know, step on this circle. You know, giving them their instructions. But he's not screaming at everybody. He seems calm. Kind of a smaller guy. Self-possessed. You know, just giving them the instructions. And it's going to be pretty easy. He says that night, though, there was something that baffled him. Something didn't feel right. I tried but failed to connect some dots. The soft-spoken MTI was a pretty small guy, probably 5'9", about 160 pounds. He didn't yell once. For a few hours, he had us filling out paperwork and telling us rules. I honestly thought that if this guy was going to be leading me for eight weeks, it'd be a mini vacation. But the thing that wasn't clicking was that draped over the chairs that lined the walls in the day room were t-shirts that said 325-pound bench press club, 375-pound bench press club, 450 pound bench press club, 500 pounds. And these t-shirts couldn't have belonged to this guy. If this guy could get up to 225, I'd be shocked. As I laid down to sleep, I concluded that basic training with a guy so soft-spoken couldn't be legit. It wasn't. So 4 a.m. he gets woken up. Somebody comes banging up, screaming, wake the hell up, line up in the hallway, hurry, hurry, hurry. So he's jumping out of bed with everybody else. And he sees the guy who that 500 pound bench press club t-shirt had actually belonged to. This guy was the Hulk from South Carolina, Sergeant Laquan White. His brow bent as he screamed, telling us to get in the hallway, quick, fast, and in a hurry. So this was the basic training I'd expected, at least the hard-nosed badass yelling at me. This guy was what the military should strive to be. To to, to read the tale, it sounded like they live in constant fear of this person. During that first day, we were outside doing push-ups, flutter kicks, and up-downs. After most of us were gassed, Sergeant White took on a calm tone. All right, I know there's some of you who thought this was a mistake. You were thinking your decision to join the military. I'll give all of you this one chance to back out and head home. No repercussions, no penalty. If you don't think this is for you, then now is the time to say so. Just stand up and line up over at that pavement and we'll start the paperwork. You can go home tonight. He seemed very sincere. And to the five guys in our flight, he sounded sincere enough to go line up on the pavement. Huey was one of those five. The five stood there at attention. Sergeant White paced in front of them. All right, you five don't think you have it, huh? I see. He looked back at the rest of us and smirked. Well, there ain't no quitting. The rest of you get to do push-ups because of the dream team here. He got smoked more because of the five who wanted to quit. Not only were those five targeted by the MTIs the rest of the time, they were also off on the wrong foot with the rest of the flight. Week after week, Huey struggled to get right. He couldn't. He stuck at everything. I should also say that one of the other ways they make trainees fearful is by threatening them that they will get washed back in training. So washed back means you have to go to the previous class or even 
a class before that. So you've wasted all this time. You've got to redo all that training. It's, it's the greatest fear that you would get washed back. I feel no sympathy for Huey and his lack of will and ability, but the way he went was questionable. And it was the only time that I didn't do what my MTI told me to. To this day, part of me agrees with what Sergeant White did. And part of me doesn't. Every single person who had contact with him knew that Huey didn't belong. It was a six week, only two weeks left. We were all getting ready to graduate and head to our tech schools to start training for our jobs. As we were in the middle of our daily tasks, we heard Sergeant White yell, All right, everyone line up in the hallway right now! We did as we were told. At the end of the hallway, I saw Huey packing up his locker into a green duffel bag. Tears were rolling down his cheeks. Airman Huey's finally getting washed back, Sergeant White said. Huey turned with his duffel bag and started walking toward us. All of us lined up, making a tunnel to the door. Tears increased as Huey held his chin down to his chest. All right, everyone, as Huey leaves and get, gets washed back to week three, give him a farewell. The flight broke out singing the chorus of Steam's Na Na Hey Hey Kiss Him Goodbye. I didn't. I stood at attention and watched Huey cry his eyes out as he exited the dorm and headed to his new flight. And the thing is, is that Tyler was faced with this internal struggle. Because on the one hand, Sergeant White was giving him one final humiliation before his new flight. Huey would either figure it out and start contributing to the team, or he's going to feel that humiliation again. And so, it's just one more bout of humiliation. Like, all right, you know, can you get it together now? Will this be the ticket? Is this going to be what it takes for you to finally get it together? But the other part of me knew that Huey didn't have a chance, and he should have been kicked out of the military right then and there. Stomping him into the ground with more humiliation didn't make sense to me. This was further than it needed to be. None of this changed my mind about Sergeant White. When it comes to life and death situations, there's almost nobody I trust more. In fact, it only made me question my own sanity. Why did I not participate in singing? Why did I empathize with this sack of lard named Huey? Did Huey deserve any sympathy at all? I think it's an interesting question. You know, this, this sort of this guilty feeling like, is there a weakness in me that I would sympathize with this weakling? But I don't really think that's it. I mean, as we're going to go on to see, there's a lot of things that happened in Tyler's life. A lot of times when humiliation was the tactic um, that was designed to manipulate. And some people react to it in the sense of, okay, I don't ever want to feel that way again. So I'm going to do whatever this person needs me to do so I don't have to feel that way again. But... In Tyler's experience, he'd also seen people who crumbled under that constant drumbeat of you're not good enough, you're not good enough, you're not good enough. And it would seem to me that he's not necessarily empathizing with Huey, but more is it that he knows that humiliation has never paid dividends to certain people who don't respond to humiliation. Now we're going to go back to December 28th, 2007, the place we started at where his mom is not okay, and they're in the hospital. He writes, sitting on mom's hospital bed, I looked up at her. To that point, I had managed to hold back the tears and swallow the lump in my throat. After seeing what he'd done to her face, I had to look away again. The lump in my throat came back and the tears welled once more. I didn't want to cry and be weak when mom needed us most, when my brothers needed us to be strong now. I looked at both my brothers and I knew that they were thinking the same thing as me. I could see the lumps in their throats as they fought to hold back the tears too. I couldn't look at mom or I'd let it all out. For a few moments, we sat there, together in our new, broken reality. It's okay to cry, Mom said. In an instant, all three of us embraced our mom, and the four of us cried. I held on to my brothers and my mom as tight as I could. It's rough, but we're going to keep going. Okay, chapter two. I love how... Again, he's going to start in one place, go somewhere else, and we're going to find it all woven together by the end of the story. I'm gonna, I'm, I know I've already said it. I just find it so satisfying as a storyteller. This story starts out with, when you're a kid, whatever reality is served up in front of your face is normal. You have nothing else to compare your life to. Unwillfully ignorant and unaware of what else is there, normal is whatever you're given. 
The normal for Jerry Zimmer was that of being a stinky, poorly dressed outcast since the day he'd moved to my town and joined my fifth grade class. He smelled like some strain of dried piss on most days, and as a fifth grade kid, that was, pre- that was predictably bad for his social standing. So Jerry got left out of everything. I mean, because nobody wanted to hang out with him. He kind of just grossed people out. The girls didn't want to hang out with him. The boys were not really into letting him play kickball with them. I mean, sometimes they let him in, but like, you know, the kid was an oddball, um, according to the fifth graders. And it got even worse for him because one Monday, they all came to school and there was this horrific smell. And they couldn't figure out what it was. And then the principal routes out the fact that in Jerry's locker, he had all of these milk cartons, like the school milk cartons that you would get at lunch in his locker. And they'd all spoiled in his locker, creating this horrific stench. So that did not help him at all. Because already he's got this weird smell. And now he's got, he, he was the cause of the gross smell that, you know, messed the school day up for everybody. So he writes, it was about two weeks after the milk carton incident that Jerry sent out his birthday invitations. He gave everyone, he gave one to everyone in the class. And Tyler quickly put it in his backpack. He was like, okay, not going to that. And then one Saturday, he comes upstairs and he sees a birthday present on the kitchen table and he asks his mom, what's that? And she says, that's for your friend Jerry. The party's in an hour. What? He's going to that? That wasn't the plan. Mom, Jerry's not my friend. I said, I'm not going to his party. He stinks. Mom looked at me with scorn. And when she scorns you, you know she's not messing around. The hairs on my neck quickly stood up. I never messed with mom in that look. How would you feel if you invited him to your party? He didn't show up. You need to treat others how you want to be treated. I don't care if you think he stinks. You're going. Off, I reluctantly went to Jerry's party and we were late, which made things worse on the way there. First, I was going to be a jerk and not go, and then I dragged my feet. Mom was not happy with my attitude. At least my friends will be there, I thought. But then, when it gets to the Wendy's restaurant where the birthday party is going to be, not even one person showed up to Jerry's party. He was the only one that went. And he writes... I remember a few things from that day. I remember eating Wendy's and then getting to watch Shrek at the theater and then playing with Legos at Jerry's house until I got picked up. Plus, Jerry's house had that awful smell that we always smelled at school. His mom made us a snack, and when she opened the fridge, I saw milk cartons from school. The same kind Jerry had let the musk in his locker over the weekend. I also remember that I had a fun time. I didn't even think about the smell after a while. When I left, Dad told me that Jerry's family heated their house with wood and that sometimes burning certain wood gives off a bad smell, especially if the house isn't properly ventilated. I couldn't figure out the milk carton thing at the time, but later realized Jerry's family was so poor that he was stealing cartons at lunch and milk break to bring home to his family. Unfortunately for him, he just forgot to bring them home on Friday. Poor Jerry. Y'all, don't you feel bad for Jerry? I feel really bad for Jerry. I mean, I understand how fifth graders can be mean and all that, and I don't expect them to rise above, but I'm really glad he went to his birthday party because I feel bad for Jerry. I was never close with Jerry, but I never left him out of kickball, and I told others to stop teasing him about his smell. Jerry's piss smell came from the wood heater, I told them, like I was some kind of an expert on wood heaters. Jerry's normal was getting made fun of for stinking like piss because of something he had no control of, and nobody showed up at his party humiliation. Normal was his poor wood-heated trailer house and gamble-addicted chain-smoking parents who helped them stay poor. He didn't know any different. Nobody of us do growing up. All right, that's Jerry's story. But what's Tyler's story? He says, like Jerry, I thought everything I grew up with was how almost everyone was raised. I thought everybody was scared to death of their dads and that their moms cried about their scary dads and that every adult loved that nasty beer taste with their pills. I didn't start realizing until I was 14 that the normal in my house wasn't what everyone else had. So he goes on to say that when he was growing up, his parents had rules, at least for him and Devin. It was different when Bo came along because Bo was a lot younger than them, that they had to be involved with something all like all around. All year long, they had to be doing something. Um, they're not going to be sitting around playing video games. So it was either you got to play a sport, you got to play an instrument, you got to do a club at school, you got to do something. And he played football in the fall, baseball in the spring, in the summer. He rotated guitar lessons, wrestling, basketball in the winter. The kid was busy. He and Devin were good at sports. And he says a lot of that has to do with the fact that their dad pushed them really hard. Like really hard. And at the one hand, he says, you know, dads need to push you 
their their son's hard. You know, it's like you've got to feel the weight of your dad on you a little bit as a boy. But the problem was is that the dad, their dad, wasn't just pushing them in like a fatherly, come on, you know, you got this kind of way. He says, sometimes when we got yelled at for playing poorly, it just didn't feel right. I didn't see other kids' parents doing and saying what he did. Our dad would take us to the baseball field to practice pitching. But we'd leave after about three pitches because we couldn't throw a strike. Throw a fucking strike or we're leaving, he'd say. The pressure would be on. And then I'd throw one in the dirt and I'd hit my dad's chin and the F-bombs would drop and we'd be headed home. And the rest of the evening, it would be all walking on eggshells because of that one stupid incident in which he had accidentally not thrown a strike and it had accidentally hit his dad in the shins and the entire night is ruined because his dad's pissed off now and it's all walking on eggshells from here on out. Kid's 10 years old and it's just a hot mess if he can't do something exactly right. It's had different effects on both of them. For Tyler... It made him want to do better, right? It made him want to figure out what it was that he could do so his dad would would quit freaking out. But for Devin, it just scrambled him to be screamed at like that. He says, my dad acting like that made me want to do well. So I didn't have to see him pissed off. And I was usually one of the best players on my teams because of that, all the way through high school. It was also equally rewarding when I was the best player because my dad was proud as hell. One of the first times I realized that I could get that reaction from him was in fifth grade. So he intercepts his pass. He runs down for a touchdown. And his dad is ecstatic, you know, and he's got him. The team's cheering him. His dad's raising him into the air. And it was great. And it was great because not only had he gotten his dad to be proud of him on the sidelines, but he knew that the weekend was going to be calm and his dad wouldn't be screeching at them all weekend because he was, you know, living off the high of what Tyler had been able to do. Says my dad was happy at home and we didn't have to walk on eggshells. My friends liked me and the girls in the class fawned all over me. I wanted to keep feeling that good. So I kept getting better and better so that I could. I know Devin wanted to do well too. But when we were nine and 10 years old, instead of channeling the humiliation our dad made us feel, Devin would cry on the pitcher's mound when dad yelled at him. And when he would start crying, dad would start yelling more in front of the entire crowd and other players. It just snowballed the humiliating feeling and caused Devin to withdraw and rebel against what dad wanted him to do. Devin didn't want to play anymore. He didn't want to feel that anymore. And I don't blame him. But the thing is, is that the antics of their father were not just, it wasn't just a family affair in which he would pour out his indignation at on his kids. He, I mean, this was a side that many people saw of him. The years dad would coach us, the other parents didn't even want their kids playing with. The years dad would coach us, the other parents didn't even want their kids playing for him. One day we were at a baseball park and my mom was talking to another mom who said that she would, quote, never let her son play for that one coach. The way he talks and treats his players is not okay. That one coach was my dad. I still wonder why and how dad ever got like that. Why did he treat us like that? Did he have good intentions for us? Was it stemming from his own insecurities? What was his dad like with him? His grandfather to his dad. The best assumption I have is that most of the emotional abuse and bipolar mood swings stemmed from substance addiction. His mom did her best to shield them from from what was actually happening. And he says that one day, he walked into the laundry room and found her bawling her eyes out, pacing and mumbling, I can't. I just can't anymore. I can't take it. I knew what she couldn't take, but I didn't know all of it. Mom hid a lot from us and from and for our own good. She wanted them to have a normal life. She wanted them not to realize that their father was really struggling with addiction. And he says, you know, for the longest time, he thought that what his dad liked to do was just to drink beer. You know, he that was obvious that his dad enjoyed beer and enjoyed it too much. He said, when I was 12 on our traveling baseball trips, he would drink with two of the other dads until 1 or 2 a.m. to the point where he was stumbling and incoherent. And of course, they've got a game at 8 a.m. His dad's still plastered. And the thing about it, too, was that his dad was kind of goofy when he drank. And so it was just embarrassing, you know, just like his dad acted weird. And he acted in a way that the other dads didn't act. And the whole thing was just humiliating. But a revelation came when he was about 14 years old that it was not just the beer. So he's at home. It's summertime. It's about 10 a.m. 
His mom's at work. His dad's at home, but his dad's asleep. The phone rings. Apparently, he had to go to the orthodontist. Um, they were going to, you know, finalize the stuff about his braces, sign some paperwork, and then he was going to get his braces on. Well, he had an appointment that he was late for, and the orthodontist called and said, hey, if you can still make it, we can still fit you in. We need to get this paperwork done. Well, now he's between a rock and a hard place, because what is he going to do? If he wakes his dad up, his dad's going to be pissed. If he doesn't wake his dad up, then his dad's going to be pissed that they missed the appointment. So what's he going to do? Well, he decides to go wake his dad up, and predictably, his dad is annoyed. Dad, I said as I opened his bedroom door. He was sitting on the side of the bed, swaying, his eyes closed. Dad? I said, concerned. He snapped his head up. Yeah, just a second. When we left, I didn't notice anything really wrong. All I thought about was what his mood would be later in the day after this inconvenience in his morning. The orthodontist's office was about 10 minutes away, and at the first stoplight, I realized something wasn't right with him. When the light turned green, I stayed looking forward, waiting for him to start driving, but he didn't. The car behind us honked, and the light turned red again before he could go. I looked over at him, and he was asleep. His eyelids were fluttering, mouth wide open like someone drooling in ecstasy. The car behind us honked again as we sat at the red light. Dad snapped up to look in the rearview mirror, eyes heavy. Fuck you honk for, go to hell, he said. Dad, you missed the green light, I said immediately regretting saying it. I didn't miss a light, he slurred. I stared straight forward knowing if I said anything, I'd get yelled at again. He somehow managed to get us to the orthodontist's office in one piece, falling asleep a few more times at the lights, but not missing any green ones. So you guys, this next bit, oh, I'm cringing so hard. When they enter the waiting room, he sees some kids from school. Not just some random kids. There's one girl, some pretty girl from his class, who's sitting there watching him. And Tyler's going to go and be the adult in this situation. And that's what's going to come up like multiple times in this story. I'm like, Oh, I hate how you're having to like be the grown up, but he goes up to the window to the receptionist. He's like, sorry, I'm sorry we're late. She's like, it's okay. We'll call you. Just wait. So they're sitting there waiting and his dad is keeps passing out. His dad is not awake. And you guys, it's not like it's just him and his dad in the waiting room and no one's witness to this. The girl from his class. He said, I made eye contact with the pretty girl from my class and quickly shifted my eyes to the ground. I felt humiliated. Please freaking call us back soon, I thought. I wanted to crawl into a damn hole. We sat for about five minutes before getting called back, but it felt like an hour. I got up to follow the receptionist and was so eager to leave the waiting room that I forgot to make sure Dad was with me. I looked back and he was still sitting there with his eyes closed. Dad, I said in the front of the room. He snapped up. Yeah, I'm coming, he said, irritated, thankfully restraining the curses this time. So they're sitting there. The... um. The assistant's kind of going through the insurance, kind of going through the slides. This is what it's going to, we're going to do. Da, 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 given the, you know, given the whole thing, given the whole spiel about it. And for a few slides, he thought his dad might be able to make it, but no. The receptionist noticed that his dad had kind of like slipped back into a stupor. So he leans over and he's like tapping his dad's leg, trying to get him to wake up. And she's concerned and she's looking at Tyler like, is your dad okay? And I'm like, what is he going to do? Like, he's 14 years old. How is he supposed to handle the situation? Anyway, she rushes through the spiel because clearly we need to wrap this up. And she pushes a piece of paper over to Tyler's dad and is like, can you sign this? And he's like, yeah. But then he proceeds not to sign it. And she gets up and leaves the room thinking he's going to sign it. But when she comes back, he still hasn't signed it. His head is drooping, almost hitting the table. His eyes are fluttering. She comes in. She's like, sir. And she looks at Tyler again. Uh, well, don't look up at him. What's he supposed to do? Dad snapped up, signed the paper. And when I say signed the paper, he might have managed two lines. Nothing close to his real signature, even an English letter. Now it's time to walk the gauntlet again. There's his classmate. I caught my classmate's eyes on the way out. And again, I snapped them to the floor and put my chin in my chest. The last thing I wanted to do after this embarrassing show was faced my classmates when school started back up. On the drive home, he fell asleep a few more times, and I got yelled at a few more times for waking him up. We got home, and he went to his room, and he closed the door. And he refrained from telling his mother, because what's she going to do about it? 
You know, she's got enough on her plate. She already knows everything's a mess with him, you know, and then it's just going to make her feel like this heavy weight because she's got to go to work. But then if she leaves them, the boys at the house, if they have to go, they're getting in the car with their inebriated dad. I mean, what's she going to do with this information? So he refrains from telling her, but he does tell Devin about it because he's got to tell somebody like, what was this that I just experienced? And Devin goes, dude, he did the same thing when I rode with him the other day. He was hitting himself in the head and plucking at his hair trying to stay awake. That was when I finally and undoubtedly realized that this wasn't everyone else's normal. And this was messed up. I didn't see anyone act like dad did that day until years later when I had a patient in the military who was addicted to opiates. Hmm, interesting. The normal fog has lifted and he's seeing it now for what it is. Like Jerry, our normal was not the popular norm. Unlike Jerry, for most of my childhood, my home norm was not visible to the outside world. Jerry had to walk around with his stink and his poor clothes. Unless you saw my dad when he was messed up, you probably didn't know anything was off in my house. Luckily for my brothers and me, we had a great social life at school. We were in the popular cliques, girls loved us, and we were good at sports. It was all a good distraction and part of the reason I really enjoyed escaping to school. But I stopped enjoying it after a while because his dad had had to have those whiskey license plates. So apparently in Minnesota, I don't know, I've not seen this anywhere else, but it could be my own ignorance. If you get a DUI, all of the cars in the family that are like registered under your name have to have a, it's a white plate. It's got a W beginning the number and they call them whiskey plates for the W and the DUI. And all of the family's cars had the whiskey plates on them. So when he'd go to school, it's like this public humiliation that things are not quite what they should be at his house. Um, He says that, in his junior year, um, he says, all my friends, my friends' parents, my teachers, they all saw it and they all knew. My mom and brother wore the same badge of humiliation on their cars. At this point, my parents were officially separated and living in different homes, but we still had to have the plates on our cars. I hated it. One day in calculus, one of the senior football players asked me in front of the whole class why I was driving around with whiskey plates. I don't know why he did that, whether he was trying to embarrass me or if he was asking genuinely but it definitely made me feel humiliated. I didn't answer. The only thing I could do was ignore the public humiliation as best I could. I had no choice but to do that or become a little poor me cry baby in front about it. I never let it affect me in front of anyone. But on the ride home from football practice that day, I remember praying to God to take my dad out of my life, make him go away, make my mom stop crying, make the terrible feelings for my brothers and me go away. I channeled all of this negative energy into the football field. It was an exciting year for the team, going into the semifinals at the state for the first time in over a decade, and I had a good enough year that my teammates voted me as one of the team captains the next season. In one of the last games that year in October, my dad was in the stands. He'd missed most of the season because he was in rehab. I was proud of him at the time for doing that, seemingly wanting to change his habits. At the game, we were playing our rivals and losing just about halftime. It was the playoffs, so if we lost, the season was over, and it was not looking good. But... In the third quarter, they took the lead, and he intercepted a pass, returned it for a touchdown. Then, um, the very next play was a kickoff, and he intercepted another pass. So, I mean, he's winning all the way down that field. He says, we won the game, we moved on to win another game, and we played in the Metrodome. I was on cloud nine. All my friends loved me, my team loved me, thousands of people cheered for me. And on the bus ride home, I got a text from my dad saying, I'm so proud of you, son. I loved you. That's the last sober thing I remember my dad saying to me. About two months later on Christmas Eve, God would answer my prayer. Just not in the way I ever expected it. And that is the end of that chapter. And tell me right now, if you were sitting down reading this book by yourself, would you just be like, all right, home, case closed, I'm going to move on. No, every single chapter is like this. You're like, I got to read the next one. I got to read the next one. And we are going to read the next one. Okay, we're on chapter three. This is the setup for this chapter, right? Because you know how he does. He starts with a story. He's going to ping pong us around a little bit. We're going back to that that story, the one that we started off with, the one that has left his mother in a hospital bed, her face completely bashed in, unrecognizable. We don't know anything about how that happened, why it happened, where it happened, who did it. But we're going to go back to that incident again. But from a different angle, he's with his grandmother right now. He writes, Grandma and I parked in front of the Baxter police station. My heart began to racing the cop cars and thinking about two days before when I was sitting in the back of one. 
We walked inside where the investigator, a man I recognized from church, greeted us at the door and brought us into a pictureless room. He was holding a manila folder. I'll be right back. Do you guys want some coffee or water or anything at all? We shook our heads and he walked out. I sat next to Grandma, waiting for the man to come back so I could tell him the stories of Christmas Eve. I knew it would be easy to tell him the story because it had been replaying in my head on a loop for two days straight. I felt calm with Grandma there, a constant pillar in my life, someone I knew I could go to. That's why she was the first one I called that night. So, in typical Tyler fashion, he's going to start one way, we're going to go another. And so he pings off to another story. He says, my grandma is the best storyteller I ever met. My favorite is the story of Kill You, the widowed witch who'd lived just down the road from the Legg family farm when my grandma was a girl. When my grandma was six, her father convinced her and her brother Jim, seven at the time, that Kill You had murdered five of her husbands, and that they both needed to stay away from Kill You's farm no matter what. It was dangerous over there. With that terrifying education about the dangers of Kill You ingrained in my grandma's head, it only sparked curiosity and a sense of adventure. My great-grandfather would have told them that certain death awaited, and it would have only sparked more curiosity. Fearless as most kids that age are, not yet fully conditioned to letting fear drive their decisions. We should go to her house, Jim said. Let's steal some crackers from Kill You, Grandma said, and they were off. Legend has it that Jim was reaching for the crackers in Kill You's kitchen when Grandma clumsily cl- kicked over a mop bucket, making a crash and causing Kill You to rise from her midday slumber in a rage so deep that the entire town of Forest River, North Dakota, could feel the seismic shift. Before Grandma and Jim slammed the door behind them, they saw Kill You grab a hatchet. They were no longer fearless kids, and the three of them were off to the races. The story always ends with my Grandma and Jim running for their lives from Kill You across the field, where my father and grandfather were bailing hay, Kill You running after them with the hatchet, and their father yelling, Run, you little sons of bitches! Run! I told you, run! How did Chase end? I have no idea. Never asked about that part. The story as she tells it is so perfect to me, any more details might ruin it. I think what's important about this tale is that no matter how many times we learn something and we're told how things are in the world, we won't fully understand until we find out for ourselves. We must experience the senses of a situation so that we fully grasp it. Out of stubbornness, curiosity, ignorance, I don't know why we do it. I think it's different for everyone. But all of us ignore warning signs and information to seek out the truth with our own eyes or to hold on to hope where there is none. Sometimes as we experience new truths, the loss of innocence is our own doing. Other times, the kill you villains come and devail us when we are least expecting it, or at least willing to face reality. Fear is born. Fear then takes over. Books and teachers can't teach you a thing about any of this. You need to feel it to know it. I sat with Grandma waiting, and I thought about how scared I was that night, and how scared I was for the future now. So just when you think we're going to find out a little bit more about what happened with his mom, we don't. Now we're going to go back to 2011. This is him figuring out what's going to go on with his military career. He's told us about how he was in the Air Force. He's told us about basic training. But how did he find himself in the Air Force? Was that a straight from high school decision? Like what? How, how did he even find himself there? So he's going to tell us. He says, I joined the military because I couldn't afford college. And anyone taking out student loans can't afford it either. But that's what I did for a full year. I had no business going to college in the first place. Not because I wasn't smart enough to do well. I earned a 3.2 GPA my freshman year with a 3.8 in high school but because I couldn't buy into the college system from the very start. I could not, and I still can't, understand why they wanted me to pay eighty dollars to $100,000 for a degree that didn't guarantee me a job. At 18, I was ill-equipped to make this decision, when all I knew about was girls, football, and baseball. Maybe that's my own fault, or maybe I was just an 18-year-old kid. I succumbed to peer pressure, and like most 18-year-olds, I fell for this college scam. It's what my high school teachers and friends all said was the next step. So it's what I thought I was supposed to do, even though I didn't want to. I hated school, and I only did it because I had to. So his problem at this point was everyone said he's supposed to go to college. But what, what happens when you get to college, and you're scheduling your classes, and you've got everything sort of squared away, and then you find out that you're $4,000 short of your tuition money? He can't take out any more loans. He writes, my father was in prison. Prison? When that happened? And my mom had to file bankruptcy after he went away and still weighed down with with her own student debt and now his debt after they consolidated their loans while also raising two teenage boys at home. Cash was sparse. $4,000 at that time would have made us feel very wealthy. I didn't know it yet, but I didn't have a co-signer with good enough credit to take out any more debt for my education. 
So he went to the bank. Um, they wouldn't give him any more loans. He looked into more federal aid. But unfortunately, he was just too white, too privileged to get any more money. And he writes, my quote, privilege struck again. I knew I would find a few jobs that would cover at least part of the bill, and the cycle would continue until after I was done with college. I'd be scraping pennies and eating ramen all the way through, and then, when I was done with school and had to start making payments on the loans, the cycle would continue. Till the day I died, I'd probably be living under a debt rock for decades. That summer, I started talking with a recruiter, and by the spring of 2011, I was leaving for basic training and an experience that would change me forever. So what did he do? What did he do in the military? He joined the Air Force like he's already told us, but he says that his job was as a medic, specifically a 4NOX1, or an aerospace medical technician. The training consisted first of classroom training, where they jam you through an EMT basic course on the civilian side. It's a six-month course, but in the military, they do it in a month and a half. Well, there's a real fear that you're not going to make it. Um, And he says that it was only him and three others who did make it through the EMT course. After EMT basic training, you learn more basic medical knowledge and you start some hands-on training. You learn how to do an IV, about cleaning wounds, taking care of patients uh, with mental illness like PTSD. Virtually nobody gets washed back in this portion of the training. This lasted for about two months. And after this training, you're assigned to a medical facility to do hands-on training with real patients. So the place that he ended up uh, getting his first job was the emergency room at Fort Sam Houston. It's a trauma center and San Antonio has a huge population. So the place stays busy 24-7. The guy he was assigned to was Army Medic Sergeant Johnson. And he said that the guy wasn't like rude or anything, but it was kind of clear that the last thing he wanted was a tag along. He says, I'd probably been his 100th trainee and a week from then, he'd probably have another trainee. Sergeant Johnson had been in the army for almost 10 years and had been deployed twice. As a trainee, just learning, hearing about deployment also piqued my curiosity and I wanted to pick his brain as much as I could in case I ever found myself in that situation. Like a dumbass, one of the first things I asked was, so what are some of the craziest injuries you've treated here and when were you deployed? He kind of got a smirk as he thought about it, probably laughing at my over-eagerness to hear about the horrors of medicine. He deflected by saying, I've treated just about everything, man, here and deployed. Maybe before you leave, I'll remember some of the things to tell you. First, we have to talk about triage and what we do here up at Fort Sam. So, you know, triage is like people are going to come stumbling into the ER and you've, they've got to sort who needs to actually be seen and when, right? You know, so somebody comes in with a sprained ankle, that's probably not as bad as a person whose skull is crushed because they were in an accident, you know. So that was his job. As I sat there at the triage by the ER waiting room with Sergeant Johnson, I saw a kid about three years old running away from his mom as they were leaving the hospital. Jamel, she said. The woman was wearing an army uniform and pushing another baby in a stroller. She'd probably been in the army for at most two years, judging by her E3 rank. Jamal, if you keep running away, someone's going to steal you away. You need to stop doing that. She grabbed his hand and pulled him out of the door as she pushed the stroller with the other hand. I watched them leave and didn't think anything of it. We started evaluating the next patient in triage. She was in for an ankle sprain, nothing terribly urgent. But I was asking her the questions on the questionnaire like Sergeant Johnson had taught me to. And halfway through the questions, I heard, Hey! I turned around and saw an airman running into the ER waiting room holding a limp and unconscious child in his arms. His uniform was covered in blood. As the airman handed the child over to Sergeant Johnson, I saw that the child was Jamal, the same kid getting yelled at by his mom five minutes prior. Sergeant Johnson sprinted Jamal back to the trauma center. As Sergeant Johnson disappeared, a team of people burst into the ER waiting room from the parking lot, rolling a gurney. On the gurney was a man in his 80s. As they wheeled him by me, I saw the man reaching out toward the sky. Darla! Darla, my wife! He was crying, as if he were talking to someone above him. I followed them back to the trauma rooms. The trauma response was not like it was with the guy in the biker helmet. I followed them back to the trauma rooms. The place was packed with people and buzzing with full bird colonels who weren't there before and a real-life general, the first general I'd ever seen up close to my military career. There had to be at least 100 people in the ER. Nurses were wheeling in bags of blood and everywhere else, and everyone else was... Nurses were wheeling in bags of blood and everyone else not involved in treating the two patients stood by pressed against the walls, watching and holding their breath. I remained outside the room where they worked on the boy. So many people were working on him that I couldn't see him on the table. I stood next to an army captain. She asked me if I saw them come in. I nodded and said, yes, ma'am. 
The old man was getting worked on through the window behind me in the second trauma bay. Just a few minutes after they stopped working on the boy, the mother was brought in the ER. In my 30 plus years of life, I've only felt time stop twice, and this was one of them. The place of a hundred people who had been buzzing like a beehive so loud you couldn't hear yourself think was now still. Not a single sound. Every eye was on the dead boy's mom. She had her hand on her mouth, trying to hold it all in. She took three steps like she was wearing cement-filled shoes, and I could still hear the sound of her three steps slowly hitting the tile. Clop. 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 On the third step, she collapsed to her knees and let out the loudest, saddest wail I ever heard. Why? She cried on the ground in the middle of the ER as 100 people watched, most crying with her. There wasn't time to continue to cry with this mom. The others needed help. Quickly, other patients came, and the docs and the medics went to work. They had, they had to. People needed them. I was back in front of, I was back in front with Sergeant Johnson at triage, taking care of patients. He was shaken visibly, blood all over his scrub. Still, you wanted to know some of the craziest things I've seen. He said, "Well, there you go." That's what I'm telling you guys. These stories. I mean, they're so well told that you can just feel every part of what he's saying. I mean, that that in and of itself is so traumatic to have witnessed that whole thing. But that is its own deal. Let's go back to the trauma that was in his actual personal life. Not the trauma that he witnessed that would have been like something that would have just scared the life out of you to have seen something like that. To see this little living child running out of the door and then suddenly you know, he's gone, hit by an elderly man who lost control of his vehicle. You know, to see that would be so upsetting. But let's go back to what is actually going on in Tyler's life. He goes back to where he started in the beginning of the chapter, where he's sitting with his grandmother. Sitting with grandma, still waiting for the investigator, I played the night in my head for the 500th time in two days. I looked at grandma and thought about sitting in the back of that cop car with Bo. Bo and I had sat and watched as five police cars and two ambulances waited outside our house. Staring into our house where the Christmas tree shined bright, waiting to see if mom was okay. Waiting to see if Devin was okay. I had my cell phone and I called my grandma. Hello? Grandma said. Grandma, dad hurt mom. I said. I didn't know how else to say it. There was a second of silence. What? Why? Why? Oh my God. I had to stay calm and try to keep grandma calm. Grandma, I need you right now. Please stay calm. I don't know what to do. We're on our way, she said. It's 180 miles from Thief River Falls. The trip usually took three hours. That night, my grandma, aunt, and uncle made it in two. I looked at grandma and could hear the why from that night. It's something I was desperately trying to figure out, too. Okay, now, that's the end of that chapter. And you're like, oh, just when I wanted to find out what was going to happen. We go to chapter four. And in this chapter, we are introduced to Tyler's mom. Now, I already like her. I mean, already what little we've heard about her so far in this book. How could you not? I mean, I, I I liked who she was in the situation with little Jerry when she made him go to the party. I like the fact that even though that family is in, you know, there's a lot of chaos going on behind the scenes. She's working so hard to make sure that their lives are normal, that they are held to a certain standard, that like just because there's chaos with their dad, their life, she's trying it not to, for it not to be chaotic, you know? And I just, I love her strength of character. I just really, really like her. So I love this chapter because I really wanted to know more about her. It starts out before Tyler's even born. It was the fall of 1989 and my mom was 18 years old. She was home visiting the family farm in Thief River Falls, Minnesota, standing in the kitchen with my grandma. My father was in the living room speaking with my grandpa for the first time. My parents had just started dating. Dad was from Brainerd, which is about three hours south. Mom had moved to Brainerd to attend community college to be a travel agent. And shortly after starting her classes, she met Dad at a party. A few months later, they were sitting in Thief River Falls at the family farm. Soaking wet, my mom was about 100 pounds, and from across the counter, Grandma noticed an abnormal bump in my mom's figure. Trisha, are you pregnant? Grandma asked. What? No, Mom, she snapped. My parents left the farm that weekend and drove back to Brainerd. A few weeks later was Thanksgiving. Mom didn't make it back to the farm for the holiday, but she called during dinner when everyone was over feasting. Grandma answered the phone. Mom, my mom said with a quavering voice. Grandma could hear the tears through the phone. 
Trisha, what's wrong? Grandma asked. Nothing. I'll call back when everyone's gone, she said and quickly hung up. Back at the Thanksgiving party, Grandma leaned over to Grandpa at the dinner table. Your daughter just called crying. That evening, after everyone left, Grandma called my mom back. Trisha, why were you crying earlier? Remember a few weeks ago when you asked me if I was pregnant? She said, well, I am. After the call, Grandma went out to the shop where Grandpa was cleaning up. You know what your daughter just told me? She's pregnant. Your daughter is pregnant. Was that guy she brought home a few weeks ago? He asked. Yep, that guy, Grandma said. Neither had had the best first impression of my dad from their visit. Grandpa walked over to the phone and called my mom right away. When she answered, Grandpa asked, Do you want a crib or a cradle? That was it. Mom was terrified to hear what her parents were going to say and do with the news of her being pregnant before being married. Instead of being reprimanded, instead of worrying about what the rest of the community would think, instead of pushing her to get an abortion, my grandfather was there with unwavering and unconditional love. So, who might that baby have been? Tyler. Um, he was born on May 12, 1990. And then, uh, June 21st, mom turned 19. And on June 23rd, mom and dad got married. And then, almost a year later, on July 30th, 1991, Devin was born, a.k.a. Deve. We were just a few months short of being Irish twins. Barely old enough to have a legal drink, my parents had two kids and no money. It wasn't a perfect start. But in the early 90s, our family was bursting onto the northern Minnesota scene. Well, I just love that story. I love the fact, I love her dad's response to the situation. Because what's he going to do now? Like, he might not like the dad of this, you know, it, it, he probably was disappointed that his daughter, his beloved daughter, had found herself pregnant by this guy that neither he nor his wife cared that much for. But what are you going to do now? A new life has been created. What, are you going to bitch at the mom for it or do something about it, the baby? I mean, like, it is what it is. So make the most of it. And I really love the spirit of his grandfather in all of this. So he says, uh, he goes on to say, one thing I know for certain is that my mom had a rock solid support system from her family and friends, specifically my grandma and my grandpa, as well as my mom's two older brothers, Brent and Tron. Devin and I were at the farm with our grandparents all the time. We loved it there. Grandpa was my hero. And in my eyes, he was larger than life. He drove giant tractors and raised animals. In the winter, he worked at Arctic Cat, the coolest place I knew of at the time. He carried himself with a strength of character that no other man I knew did. People respected him. He was without a question, the rock of the family. All right, well, Grandpa might have supported his mom, but he never really was fully reconciled to Tyler's dad. He didn't fully trust him yet. Grandma told me once after a few glasses of wine that when Mom was about to walk down the aisle to marry Dad, Mom was crying. And Grandpa allegedly told her, we don't have to do this, I'll walk you right out of here right now. And she did end up walking down the aisle. And her dad supported her. He did walk her up the aisle to marry this guy, even if he thought maybe it wasn't the right decision at the time. Another person in mom's inner circle was one of her best friends, Dana. Dana and my mom grew up together in Thief River Falls, and they dreamed of running away from their small town one day and make it big somewhere. But before any of them could break free to the big city, they both got married, had kids, and both Dana and Trisha had three kids about the same ages. So, uh, Tyler writes, for the next few years, mom and Dana were calling each other, swapping tips about what to do with babies who had hand, foot, and mouth, and which stores had the best coupons for diapers and baby food. So, they weren't living the life in the big city, but they were still each other's biggest support system. And then she had her two older brothers as well. So, as mom was dealing with Devin and me, my uncle Tron, her oldest brother, had two kids around our age. Jenny and Aaron and Brent had three kids, Garrett, Kyle, and Chelsea, all around our age too. Bo would be the last to join us in 1996. Eight grandkids running around the farm and money was tight for everyone. Instead of following the travel agent path, mom began working in nursing as an LPN. Dad worked at the jail and eventually became a dispatcher. Tron worked construction and his wife Kelly was a school lunch lady. Brent was a plumbing apprentice, and his wife Janice worked at one of the local bars. When I say money was tight, I mean my Uncle Brent used to poach deer, cut it up, and disperse it to everyone to help out on grocery bills. For a few years, Mom used food stamps to get us by while she was in school. We had no idea we were poor. We had food at every meal and gifts at our birthdays and holidays. As far as I knew, we were living the dream. In 1996, when Bo was born, we were still in Thief River Falls, surrounded by our extended family. You could throw a rock in any direction and hit another family member's house. 
But not long after he was born, our family moved about four hours away to a little town called Saginaw near Duluth. Although we moved away from all our extended family and the family farm, our most beloved place, we moved closer to mom's friend Dana and her husband Joe, who had moved there a few years earlier. So they didn't have their cousins anymore, but they've got all Dana's kids to play with. And so they sort of traded their actual family for this sort of substitute, but still equally close family. You know, it was just a childhood that was full of, full of camaraderie and closeness and family and friends and community. He says, mom always had the people in her life first. And as hard as her situation was being a young mom in an abusive marriage, she was making it work. I'm convinced it's because she was putting people first in her life. But things were about to get much harder for her and fast. So then he goes on to tell this unbelievably tragic story. It's so heartbreaking. He says that one of the things that they like to do a lot as a family, as, as families together, was to go camping. And he wasn't super big on sleeping in that tent. That was not what was up. But he did like the fishing and the being outside with his cousins and um, the trip with uh, Kayla and Taylor. Um, and that was Dana's kids. And so he was willing to make his peace with the whole sleeping in a tent thing. Um, and they were planning a big trip. Um, they were going to meet everybody at the specific gas station. When they got to the gas station, they were, his dad pulled around on one side of the gas station to fill, to fill up. And he says that while his dad was pumping gas, there was a lot of commotion coming from the other side of the gas station. People stood and watched from afar. A few police cars arrived with their lights on. And after a few minutes, there was even a news helicopter circling above. Dad left the gas pump and walked over to see what was going on. He's gone for about a minute. And I can remember like it was yesterday. Dad turning the corner and walking back toward our car. His face was pale as he walked up to the passenger door and said, Trish, it's Dana and Joe. Mom got out of the car. And after she turned the corner of the store to where the scene of the car accident was, I don't remember seeing her again for a few days. Multiple helicopters now circled. Dad contacted our babysitter and she came with her mom and got us. As we were leaving the gas station with them, I saw the scene of the car crash. There was a white sheet covering the front passenger seat and the person in it. Joe had turned into the gas station. He thought he had time to turn before the oncoming car passed, but he didn't, and the front side passenger door was hit square. Mom rode to the hospital in the ambulance with the two girls, and Joe was rushed in another ambulance. This was one of my mom's closest friends and someone in her inner circle, a relationship that she'd built over decades, filled with good and bad experiences, filled with memories, filled with love, gone in the snap of a finger. No more midnight phone calls, no more camping trips, nothing. It was the saddest I'd ever seen someone in my seven years of life. As for the girls, their hearts were forever shattered that day. We'd see them occasionally after the accident, usually on birthdays and grad parties, but we were slowly growing apart. I had no grasp of the concepts of loss and grief, but this was my first experience with it. And within a year, we'd see loss and grief again. So this is, you know, he's done this great job of sort of explaining who all the important people were in his mom's life so that she could uphold for the boys what they needed her to be because she had people she could rely on. But within the span of a year, two of the big pillars get kicked out from underneath her. Her friend Dana dies in a horrific accident right at the cusp of them going on this fun camping trip. You know, just completely, just like that, gone. And then he, they find out that his grandfather is sick. They knew he was sick. He'd been diagnosed with cancer. He'd gone into remission. And then a year after Dana's death, Grandpa's cancer came back, this time in his pancreas, a spot that is about 95% fatal. It was the morning of November 6, 1998, and we were packing up the car, getting ready to head to Thief River Falls for a deer hunting opener when Mom got the phone call. She and Dad sat on the couch and told us Grandpa had died that morning. We all sobbed together for what seemed like an hour. My hero was gone. I couldn't believe it. Just gone forever? that's it? I had the hardest time trying to make sense of it all. Why? Why do you have to go? He wasn't even old. Why? I said it over and over. When they got to the farm um, to be with the family after grandpa had died, um, he, he says that they were going through all of his things. He was looking at some of his grandfather's old things. That he, down in the basement, he had this giant board of little trinkets that he'd found over the years. There's all kinds of things, arrowheads, cool rocks, old shell casings, even a gun that he'd found. The weekend he died when I was down there looking at his collection, I found a gray metal box with his name on it. 
It was about five inches wide, eight inches long, and three inches deep. Inside was an old wallet with some of his expired ID cards and old pictures. I asked my grandma if I could keep it, and she said, absolutely. From that day forward, it became my important things only box. Anything incredibly important to me went into the box, and I kept it under my bed or in my closet next to my bed so that I could still see it when I was walking into my room. I could see it every day, see his name, and be reminded of him. It was my way to never forget my hero. Within a one-year span, my mom lost two of the closest people in her life, her best friend and her father, two pillars in my mom's life, gone forever. Her inner circle shattered. I remember mom crying a lot, but the thing that kept her going was that she knew she was the pillar in other people's lives, in our lives. She had to be strong too. She was. She worked her ass off and became the only LPN hired when the new surgery center was opened in the town we eventually moved to, Brainerd. Well, we were preteens and busier than hell with baseball and friends, my mom went back to school to become an RN, and today she's a nurse manager and one of two original people left in the surgery center from when it first opened. She exudes strength, even amidst the chaos. She kept working hard, and having that to look up to was the greatest gift any of us could have received. Mom showed us that there is life after tragedy and grief, even while lying in a hospital bed after getting beat to within an inch of her life. She didn't stop and sulk and say, poor me. Being the best you and the strongest you is the most important thing you can do for the people in your life. We are a pillar in other people's lives, and they need us. We can mourn for years and years and just abandon anything of meaning in this life, or we can forge ahead. It took me a long time to see and to understand this. I think Jordan Peterson does a lot of talking about that, doesn't he? Like um, being the strongest person at your father's funeral, that, that whole picture. One of the best ways that you can minister to other people is to just swallow some of the heartache and to just be strong for the other person. And I think we do live in a day and age in which we are, we've we become so soft and so weak. It's like everybody is constantly be, being told that you just have to sort of like bleed all over the place all the time. Anytime you're hurting, you just have to like just to everybody. And it's your right and you have to and you have to like let everyone know and you shouldn't bottle anything up and all this. But there is something to be said for just being the strong one for other people, like blessing people with your strength. And, and just allowing people to lean against you because, you know, if everybody in the room is freaking out, how can we move forward? So I, his mom is like one of my favorite characters in this book, just because I so respect her. Now, let's talk a little more about his dad, shall we? Because that's the person I want some more info on. We're going to end on a two part sort of story here in which he says red flags were waving all over the place when he was a kid. And now, as an adult, he can look back and sort of put the pieces together, even if at the time he wasn't necessarily sure what was happening. He says, As I said, my grandparents were not the biggest fans of my dad. They thought he was arrogant and cocky, but they ignored the red flags as best they could and supported mom because my mom wanted to try and make it work for her kids. My grandpa taught my dad how to hunt and fish and let him use the farm shop to work on vehicles and whatever other projects he had going on. Looking back, it's funny how life presents us with the foreshadowing of fate, if you believe in that. I think it's very easy to cherry-pick dots to connect in anything we want to connect. Confirmation bias, if you want to call it that. And I'm generally a huge skeptic. But a few dots and events from that time in our lives feel hard not to connect. Okay, so he starts out by telling us a story about uh, out on the farm, him and his cousin, they had this go-kart. It didn't go that fast. Um, it only went about as fast as a, as a golf cart and they had to wear helmets um, and one day he and his cousin and Dave were out playing in the golf cart uh, Devin was taking forever with it he was going ripping around going on and on and on and Tyler and his cousin Aaron were like all right already that kid's had his turn where's our turn so they followed the hum of the small engine trying to find out where he was and then suddenly they, they hear Devin just screaming and screaming and screaming blood curdling screams and then all of a sudden Devin's rounding the corner screaming bloody murder and his face is covered in blood like a scene from Carrie his face was jacked up he ran past us and up to the farmhouse screaming the whole way well being the boys that they are they don't bother to find out what's wrong with him they just are like score the golf cart's ready it's just sitting there it's still running and they jump in and they you know go on their merry way okay but what happened to what happened to Devin, right? Like, wh- how is the golf cart completely fine, but he's scre- streaking past them, dripping in blood? Turns out Devin had rolled the go-kart, and when he did, he hit his face on the steering wheel, breaking his nose. 
He was so scared of getting in trouble that he had made sure to roll the go-kart back upward, face gushing blood as he did, before he went inside to get help. You guys, I don't know why the scene, that scene, like, hurts my heart so bad. But the idea of, like, this little kid, you know, rip-roaring through, having a great time, then he hurts himself so tragically, but the fear of being getting in trouble before he could even think about himself and the fact that his nose is broken, he's got to make the scene just right so that the grown-ups don't freak out. Oh man, I hate that for him. I hate that for him. That wasn't the end of the crazy go-kart situations out on the farm. A year and a half later in 1999, we were in Thief River Falls a lot. After Grandpa died, we visited much more than we used to. And while we were there on the weekends that year, my dad decided to build his own go-kart, wielding the frame himself and doing it around an old snowmobile engine. He did so while putting down a 12-pack here and there, welding and drinking. It's not a good idea. When it came time to test drive his monster, things went exactly as you would expect them to go. On the day of the test ride, Dad took the go-kart out toward the highway, about a half-mile long dirt road. And as he drove away from us, you could see something wasn't right. He swerved and nearly went into the ditch, going on two wheels multiple times and doing so at a very high speed. He finally got it under control and came to stop. We ran the half-mile down the dirt road where he parked to see what was going on. He said that the throttle was sticking. This should have been a signal to put the death trap in neutral and have us push it back to the shop, but he got in and decided to give it another ride, which proved to be a terrible decision and almost fatal. They're standing on the dirt road watching him careen back towards the house. His dad sped off from where they were standing going full speed. He looked like a drag racer taking off toward the farmhouse. He took the right into the circle drive and was headed right toward the farm equipment full speed. My heart started to race as I knew something wasn't right. He was about 150 yards from sure death when all of a sudden the machine swerved onto two wheels and somersaulted through the air in a cloud of dirt road dust. The go-kart flipped and rolled at least four or five times, pieces of metal and a blue helmet flying in all directions. I thought for sure I'd just watch my dad die. Dad! I yelled, running toward the cloud of dust. When the cloud settled, Dad laid in a heap in his blue shirt, torn to shreds, helmet gone, and most of the life in him gone too. <sighs> Help, he let out. I ran inside and got Mom and my uncle. Dad just crashed the go-kart and he's hurt. They rushed outside and instead of waiting for an ambulance, they loaded him up in the truck and sped off to town with the flashers on. When it was all said and done, he suffered a handful of broken ribs, a punctured lung, and a broken clavicle. It was a miracle they'd escaped with his life. But what do you think happens when you break a couple of ribs and puncture a lung and you break your clavicle and you go to the hospital? What do you think they give you for that? Over the next few months, while Dad recovered from his accident, I began to notice him acting funny. Like he was drunk, but I knew he wasn't drinking. It only ever happened when he took his pain medicine. The drug addiction begins. But the part of the story that gets weird for me is the part where my brothers and I stayed at the farm with my grandma as we rushed out of the hospital. At the time, Bo was around three and a half. Devin, Bo, Grandma, and I were all sitting in the living room looking out at the driveway. From that view, you could see where the crash began. As we sat there, Bo looked out the window and said, Grandma, it's Grandpa. We all looked at each other confused. Grandma asked him, well, Grandpa, as in your Grandpa Lou? Lou was my dad's dad and lived three hours away in Brainerd. No! It's Grandpa Irv, Bo said, pointing out the window. Bo, your Grandpa Irv's in heaven. He can't be standing there, Grandma said. He's right there, Grandma, Bo insisted. I looked at my Grandma and Devin. Grandma, make him stop, Devin said. Grandma took Bo off the couch and set him on the floor. All of us were too scared to look. But I wish I would have. They say little kids can tap into things adults can't, and that's the only example I have in my life that makes me think that might be true. A foreshadowing of fate? Whether it be divine or coincidence, the universe did a great job setting up the years to come. And that's where we leave off in part one. But wasn't that good? I mean, you guys, how many of you who are here from Tyler's channel uh, came to, to see what this book was about? I think he's alluded on his channel that this is a very vulnerable book. You know, this isn't just, you know, ha 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 and ho ho ho. And I mean just in those first four chapters alone, it's incredibly revealing. Um, and I really, really respect the honesty with which he is dealing with the stuff that happened in his childhood. And I also really like the fact that, I mean, he lets you make your own judgment about things. You know, he's he tells you just enough so that you know 
the story and what the characters are like, but he doesn't tell you, he's not trying to like make up your mind how you should feel about his dad. Like he just tells you the facts of the story and then you get to decide how you feel about it. And I can tell you what I feel right now. I don't like that guy. Um, I, I really, really, really despise bullying in, in fathers um, who rather than sort of guide their sons and daughters towards maturity um, in healthy ways, use humiliation and fear to get what they need from the family members. It's very, very, very disconcerting. Anyway, if you enjoyed that, stay tuned. Like I said, this is the week that we are going to cover this book. Um, this is a one-week event. I hope that I'll see you all tomorrow for part two of Trailer Park Parable. Bye.